Hello, this is Michelle Miller, and I am providing the information about plasma membranes today for Biology 112. And if you'll remember our, about our discussion of uh, cells, you'll remember that the cell has an outer plasma membrane, and eukaryotic cells also have internal membranes that compartmentalize the cell into different areas so that different chemical reactions can take place. And so you can really think of the cell as like a factory of uh, different things happening in different places. And you can also think of the plasma membrane, the outer plasma membrane, as regulating what comes into and out of this factory. So if you remember, we talked about the different types of big, large macromolecules, organic molecules, and one of them was a phospholipid. And phospholipids are very interesting because they are said to be amphipathic, which means they have a dual nature. And if we look at the structure, not the molecular formula, but just the structure of a phospholipid molecule, remember that they have a head end and also they have a tail. The head end is polar, and so it being polar means that it's going to be attracted to water molecules. And so we say that this part of the phospholipid is hydrophilic, water-loving. The tail is nonpolar, and so it is going to be repelled by water, so it is said to be hydrophobic. So this is the dual nature of a phospholipid. And if you place phospholipids in a beaker of water, they will arrange themselves in a particular pattern, which is what is referred to as the phospholipid bilayer. And so they actually create these little structures. If this was showing the bilayer that encloses the inside area versus the outside. This is a phospholipid bilayer. So the inside is water, the outside is water, and then the tails being hydrophobic are attracted to one another. And so this is what is referred to as a bilayer. And so if you look at the diagram of the plasma membrane in your book, it looks like this. So you see that these are the phospholipid molecules. This is the bilayer. This is just a piece of that plasma membrane. And then you'll notice that there's all this other stuff that's kind of floating around inside this bilayer. And so they call this the fluid mosaic model. Of the plasma membrane. So we knew that there were proteins associated with the plasma membrane, but the e early theories about this was is like there was a proteins on the outside and on the inside. But we now we know that the proteins are inside the plasma membrane. So all these blue things are the proteins and that they also are a variety of proteins, hence the mosaic part. And then the fluid part is, is that these proteins can actually kind of float around inside of the plasma membrane. So fluid meaning that the proteins float and mosaic means that there's a variety of proteins. So when we look at the structure, we see that there are proteins associated with the membrane, but we also see that there's other types of molecules, including cholesterol. And then if we look at this in more detail, we can see that these are sugars, monosaccharides that are attached to the outside of the cell. And so sometimes those are referred to as glyco and they're either glycoproteins and or glyco, glycogen, um, sugar, glucose attached to um, lipids. So they're called glycolipids. So the phospholipids uh, make up the majority of the plasma membrane, but there's other things associated with it. So we're gonna look at the function of these. So if we look at the proteins, 
actually. So if we look at the proteins, plasma membrane proteins, And I'm gonna put function here. So we're gonna talk about the different functions of those membrane proteins. One is that some, in some cases, they provide channels. So I'll put one, they provide channels for the movement of substances across the surface of the membrane. So movement of substances into and out of the cell. And so if we go back to our diagram, you'll notice that like this one, for example, is a channel um, protein and um, it allows substances to move actually directly through it, right? So it goes through the entire length. It's said to actually be an integral protein because it is um, going through both of the layers, okay? So that would be an example of a channel. A second function of the proteins is, is that they are receptors on the surface of the cells that can bind substances. So a good example of this would be hormone receptors So hormones are chemicals that are transported um, in the circulatory system and they travel out to the entire body, but only certain organs and certain cells have the receptor for a particular hormone. And so those hormone receptors um, allow the cell to respond to environmental stimuli. Another function besides just being receptors is also um, being able to tell or distinguish self from non-self. So third one is detecting self from non-self. Right. So this is really important when we look at the immune system because the immune system is able to recognize foreign cells based upon the proteins that are on their surface. And this is a problem if, for example, you want to receive a tissue transplant or an organ transplant because your immune system is going to um, attack the foreign tissue but it is also really important because if you're invaded by bacteria or fungi or any other thing that's pathogenic, parasites, for example, your ability to detect self from non-self is really important. So they're based on, foreign cells based on the proteins that are on their surface. And one of the really important types of proteins would be glycoproteins. So glyco are proteins that are, have sugar molecules attached to them. So sometimes this is referred to as the sugar coating on the outside of your cells. So if we go back to that diagram of the plasma membrane, these would be glycoproteins here. So it's the blue ones with the glycogen attached, the sugar attached. And so this forms a sugar coating on the outside of the cell. And this um, allows our body to detect um, our own cells as well as foreign cells. Um, and even interestingly, if your cell becomes cancerous or it becomes infected with a virus, um, sometimes it presents foreign proteins, not foreign, but abnormal proteins on the surface. And our immune system is able to tell if a cell has become cancerous or is infected by a virus and attack it and destroy it before anything um, um, goes too um, bad in the body.
So those are three functions. Fourth, go back to the whiteboard. Some enzymes are serve as, oh, excuse me, some proteins serve as enzymes. And so that enzyme that we looked at in a little bit of detail last week was lactase. And lactase is the enzyme that is necessary for breaking down lactose. And lactase um, is um, in the plasma membrane of intestinal, small intestinal cells. So in the cells in the small intestine. So in the plasma membrane of the cells lining the small intestines. So it's interesting that we have this gene and even if we don't express the gene, we still have it. It's turned on when we are babies, but it is turned off in most people when they um, become weaned However, there is some lactase persistence, which means the gene is turned on and producing lactase, which can break down lactose in certain populations of humans. So that would be another function of the plasma membrane proteins. Not all enzymes are embedded in the plasma membrane, but this just happens to be one of those. The fifth function, <coughs> excuse me, of the plasma membrane is to attach to the cytoskeleton. So it attaches to the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is really important in creating the shape of a cell. So a red blood cell looks different than a neuron, different from a skin cell and a muscle cell. But also it allows the cell to move and muscle cells contract based upon the presence of the cytoskeleton. And so the cytoskeleton is protein in the cytoplasm. So if we look at an example of this in our diagram of that plasma membrane, and you should be able to identify the different parts of this plasma membrane, you can see that some of them are, well, there's not really one here, but so this would be the cytoskeleton. And let's say it's attaching to this one. And we're going to look at some diseases that are caused by defects in this attachment. And muscular dystrophy just happens to be one of those, de those diseases that has its influence on the cellular level of muscle cells. So in muscular dystrophy, this, the, the cytoskeleton cannot correctly attach to the plasma membrane, and so the muscles cannot contract. Okay. So that's an example of a um, function of the plasma membrane. So um, besides the proteins, there are also cholesterol molecules. And the cholesterol molecules are steroids, they're lipids. And what they've discovered about these is, is that these help to maintain flu fluidity of the membrane, specific, specifically under cooler temperatures. So organisms that have um, a cooler body temperature, like say if we're talking about fish that live in the Arctic, they would have more cholesterol in their plasma membranes so that their plasma membranes stay fluid even at those cold temperatures. Um, under cold temperatures. But we also have cholesterol in our plasma membranes. Okay. So that's the plasma membrane. So let's look at how substances move through the plasma membrane. So when we talk about movement across the membrane, we can talk about what can move directly across the bilayer, the phospholipid bilayer. So when we look at that, we can say that some membranes are permeable to substances moving directly across the phospholipid bilayer. I'm just distinguishing that from movement using a channel, which is different, okay? So when we look at that membrane, what is directly permeable in the plasma membrane 
there's a few things that can move across the plasma membrane. And one of these is water. Now we're gonna talk about water in a more detail, but water also, also can use channels, but water can move directly across the plasma membrane, okay? Um, which is kind of unusual, kind of strange to me that we can do that, but it can. The second thing that can move directly across the plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, are lipids. So anything that is lipid soluble, so anything that is a lipid can be dissolved in lipids. So for example, something that can move across that would be steroids. And you might have heard of people using steroid creams. So testosterone can be found in a cream. Estrogen and progesterone can also be applied via a cream. And then also um, lipid soluble uh, vitamins, right? So vitamins um, that are lipid soluble can move across the surface. So you might have heard of A and E specifically. Vitamin A um, is retinol, sometimes used in skin creams. And vitamin E is also an oil that can be absorbed directly across the surface of your skin and it can move directly across the plasma membrane of the cell. The third um, thing that can move across the surface are gases and specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide. And that's really important because um, specifically in the respiratory system and then when oxygen and carbon dioxide get transported throughout the body, oxygen being delivered to the individual cells, it can move right across the cell membrane and get inside the cell and get inside of the mitochondria where it is used for aerobic cellular respiration. Okay. And then, um, is that all I want to say for that? Those are the main ones. Sometimes smaller molecules can move through. So when we look at things that are not permeable, it's not permeable to. Okay, so that means that it cannot move directly across the phospholipid bilayer would be charged particles or charged ions. So like sodium and chloride and potassium, for example, would all be ions that are charged, right, and cannot move across. The second thing would be um, in general polar molecules, except for water, because they have to go through that non-polar tail region of the bilayer. And the third thing that it is not permeable to are large organic molecules. So even glucose, for example, and amino acids cannot make it cross the plasma membrane, even those are, those are very simple monomers of the larger organic molecules of glycogen and proteins, okay? So if we look at factors that affect the diffusion, how fast something moves across the surface, you'll notice here that we have a bilayer and notice how we have no proteins. So this is something that is soluble, so it can move across the surface. And one thing that affects how fast it moves is how concentrated it is on one side versus the other. And so that is what is referred to as the concentration gradient. So things will move, tend to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration just by the forces of na nature. So it's a physical thing, it's not a living, um, a thing that ha takes energy, it's like gravity, it just happens. And so we have um, diffusion occurring, which is said to be passive. So what passive means is it does not require energy. If it required energy, then it would um, have to um, be part of the living system, right? So it's passive movement of substances from a higher to a lower 
concentration. Okay, so here my solute is at a higher concentration. So it is going to diffuse across and until it reaches equilibrium. And once it is equal on each side, then the fusion, they move back and cross, but there's no net exchange, right? There's, they won't actually become concentrated. So you see this all the time, like say, for example, if you're uh, mixing up colored water or maybe even like Kool-Aid, right? You put the, the substances in and then over time, if you didn't stir it, you can stir it to increase the diffusion. But if you didn't stir it over time, the um, dye and the sugar and all the other molecules would diffuse out just because of molecular movement. And then they would re reach an equilibrium if you gave it enough time. Okay, so that this is the idea of an equilibrium where there's equal um, um, solute concentrations on each side. Okay, and so I'll put until equilibrium is met. Right, so until there's an equal concentration on each side of the plasma membrane or in the whole container that you're mixing your Kool-Aid in, for example. Okay, so let's look at how the factors that affect diffusion. So we can talk about the rate of diffusion. And so this is how fast, right, something will move. And so one thing that affects it is the concentration gradient. So what you find is as equilibrium, you get closer and closer to equilibrium, um, the diffusion rate will decrease. So if you start out and there's like all the solutes on our one side and there's none on the other, diffusion will occur fast and then it will start to slow down until equilibrium is met. So the concentration gradient can affect that. So if you increase the concentration gradient, I'll just abbreviate it there. Then you increase the rate. Okay. The second thing that affects it is the size or the mass of the molecules. Okay. So if you increase the mass, it's going to take longer and you're going to decrease the diffusion because heavier molecules and bigger molecules take longer to diffuse. Another thing that affects diffusion um, is the solvent density. Right? So if the solvent, remember when we look at a solution, when we look at this, it is composed of, um, I'll put an equal sign there, sorry. It is composed of solutes plus a solvent, right? And so when we look at um, the concentration of solutes, if you um, become dehydrated, right, then you would decrease the amount of solvent and you would increase the solutes. And so the solutes, there would be a greater density of solutes. And then that means that diffusion will be harder or more difficult to obtain. So during dehydration, right, solvent is lost. And, you know, I think I'm going to not use solvent density. I think we want to use solute density. Sorry, solute density. I think maybe your book uses solvent density, but it makes more sense to me to use solute density. The solvent is lost, and you have a greater concentration of solutes. And so it's much more difficult for diffusion to occur in that particular instance because it's freshly pressing against, right? Um, that density of solutes um, in solution. Okay. Um, we can also look um, specifically um, as an example at the respiratory membrane. 
and I'm using the respiratory membrane because this is the membrane where um, in your lungs, gases diffuse from the lungs to the blood. And so I'm gonna put an arrow that goes in both directions. So oxygen moves from the lining of the lungs into the blood and CO2 moves in the opposite direction. And so when we look at that respiratory membrane between the lungs and the blood, we can look at things that affect the rate of diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so those things would be like the thickness of the membrane. So in people with emphysema, this membrane can become very thick. So as you increase the thickness of the membrane, you decrease the diffusion of the gases. So it becomes very hard for people to get enough oxygen into their blood. Um, and so they have very low levels and it feels like they are oxygen starved in people that have emphysema. Okay. We can also look at the surface area. So the surface area is the area over which diffusion takes place. And so if you increase surface area, you also increase diffusion. And so our lungs have a very big surface area. And like with emphysema causing a thickness of the membrane, emphysema also tends to destroy the tissue so that there's a decrease in the surface area so diffusion doesn't take place um, as rapidly. So that's just a, some examples of the things that affect the diffusion of the gases, um, um, specifically when we're looking at the diffusion of something across a membrane. Okay, so we can talk, we talked about simple diffusion. So this is facilitated. So this is versus simple. So simple is without a protein. So facilitated diffusion requires a protein and the protein can either be a channel or a carrier. Now it's still diffusion because it does not require energy. And things are moving with their concentration gradient. So just like before, things move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So here would be an example of glucose. So when we reabsorb glucose from our urine prior to um, getting rid of it, um, we have um, in our kidneys cells that have channels that allow glucose to move through so it goes back from the, the urine back into the blood so we can reabsorb glucose. This might also be an example of a plasma membrane of a cell in your small intestine. And this is allowing glucose to move. So glucose is still moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration here, okay? So that is a channel. Carrier proteins are a little bit strange and we don't really understand how they work, but rather than just providing a channel, the protein itself binds to the molecule and then changes shape and then somehow transports it through the plasma membrane. So in your book, they show a diagram of this. Okay, so these would be carrier proteins. So the carrier protein just shows that rather than just being a straight channel, the protein actually binds to the substance, changes shape itself, probably because of the way that it is folded and then allows substances to move through, okay? So carrier proteins um, also are in our plasma membrane. Okay. So there is a special type of diffusion, which is called osmosis. And this is specifically the diffusion of water. 
Now, this can be simple diffusion because it can be without a protein. So water can just move across the plasma membrane itself, or it can be facilitated diffusion. And the example of facilitated fusion would be that it requires a protein. And just within my lifetime, you know, when, we, when I was studying this as a, a student 20 years ago, they didn't know this, but they are proteins that are called aquaporins, water pores. And these are proteins that can create channels for water to move. And this is actually faster than simply diffusing across the plasma membrane. So it's both simple and facilitated, okay? Now, when we look at the diffusion of water, we need to talk about its concentration. And it is easier actually to describe not the concentration of the solvent, but the concentration of the solute. So we can talk about the relative solute concentrations. Oops. Okay. So we can say that something is hypertonic. Sometimes this is called osmotic, hyperosmotic. So I'll write that down. Hyperosmotic. Okay. So think hyper, think above. And so this has a greater solute concentration. So think about uh, salt water has a greater, like in the ocean, has a greater concentration of um, solutes than fresh water. Okay, so that would be hyper, the ocean is hypertonic to fresh water, okay? We could also say something is hypotonic, and so hypo means below. So we could say, we could talk about something that is hypoosmotic or hypotonic. And this means that it has a lower solute concentration. And then finally, we can talk about something that is isotonic. And this means that it has, or isoosmotic, Sorry, isoosmotic. And this means that it has the same solute concentration. Okay. So if we look at what we put into our bodies, like if we were going, if we needed fluids, isotonic solution to us is what we call saline. Right. So if you needed fluids, they would give you saline. They would not give you pure distilled water, nor would they give you water that is as concentrated as salt water, marine in the ocean, right? So they give you saline. So that means that it's the same sol solute concentration as your body fluids, as the inside of your cell and the outside of your cells, okay? The reason why this is important is because even though we might have a membrane where the solutes cannot move, we could have the movement of water, right? So when we're talking about osmosis, it's the movement of water, not the solutes. So the solute here is impermeable. Otherwise, we would have movement of the solute. In this case, the solute would move from a higher concentration to lower concentration, okay? But in this case, it's not the solute that's moving. It is the solvent, the water. So if we look at this beaker here, right, and, and this is gravity, right? So gravity is down holding this water at an even level. If we look at here, water is at a higher concentration out on this side of the beaker, okay? So water is going to move like this, just passively, right? Simple diffusion. Now, it is actually going to move so much so that it is actually going to exert an opposite force on gravity. So this is what we call osmotic pressure, right? And so you'd be like, oh my gosh, how could this push against this column of water? Well, the osmotic pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure 
for pushing down on the column of water. So this is what we call osmotic pressure. Right. So that's the movement of water. And when we move water, sometimes we exert a pressure and it pushes back um, on, um, it's a force that can press back on the forced atmospheric pressure or hydrostatic pressure or other, other like, um, other pressures. Okay, so when we talk about like blood flow and the movement of blood fluid back into the um, into the vessels, the blood vessels, sometimes we talk about this osmotic pressure. Okay, so um, it's important to realize that these are relative solute concentrations. So it's got to be compared to something else. Okay, so if we look at um, plants where the tonicity is readily observable, observable. So being tonic means being rigid. And since plants have an outer cell wall, unlike animals, they have an outer cell wall. And what happens is, is that when they lose water to their environments, sometimes they wilt, right? And so it's the pressure of water against that cell wall that gives plants their turgidity. And so sometimes if your plants end up looking like that, if you water them, they'll start looking like that again. Or if you have like wilty vegetables in your refrigerator, you can just put them in water. Like um, a good one to do with celery, you know, your celery's wilted. If you just put it in water, it'll suck the water back up and become turgid again, okay? So that's in plants. If we look at what happens in, um, in uh, red blood cells, so let's say that we have a beaker of distilled water and distilled water is only water, okay? It doesn't have any solutes in it. It's just water molecules and hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. So here's my red blood cell. So when I look at, if this is distilled water, I can look at um, the um, movement of water um, either into or out of the cell. So I would say that the distilled water is hypotonic compared to the inside of the red blood cell. So what would happen if you gave somebody a transfusion um, and you gave them distilled water instead of saline? What happens is, is that water is at a higher concentration outside, and so it is going to flood into the inside of the cell, shown right here, and it's actually going to cause the red blood cells to rupture. So all the red blood cells would rupture and the person would immediately die. Okay. The opposite happens if you put them in salt water. So in salt water, the outside is hypertonic compared to the inside. And so water will leave the cells and the cells will get um, deformed because they get all wrinkled because they're dehydrated. And then in an isotonic solution like saline, water goes back and forth and there's no net loss or net gain of water. And so we have um, the, um, the cells being able to survive, okay? So this is the, the, the importance is being able to describe things um, relative to one another. So in this particular instance, we would say that the red blood cell is hypertonic compared to the distilled water. Okay. So when you answer a question like this, you have to guess, well, what am I comparing it to? because it depends upon which one you, you talk about first compared to the other, whether it's hypotonic or hypertonic. Okay, so those, those terms do not make sense unless you're describing one thing compared to another. So they're relative terms. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about today is active transport. So this is not diffusion, not diffusion. Okay. It does require a protein like facilitated um, diffusion, 
and it does require energy in the form of ATP. So I'll just put, it does require ATP. The other thing that's about active transport is it is moving substances against their concentration gradient. So it moves substances against their concentration gradient. Okay, so instead of from a higher to a lower, we have a lower concentration on one side of the membrane and we're going to move substances to a higher concentration. So this would be like, remember the um, analogy of the, of the dye molecule in water and how it diffuses? This would be like if you had blue water and somehow you could put energy into it and you could get all those dye molecules back into the center of the um, of the beaker, that would be what it's like because you're moving things against their concentration gradient, which would require lots of energy. Now, um, the biggest or the best example of this that occurs that's really important in humans is what is called the sodium potassium pump. And in this particular instance, this occurs in nerve cells and neurons. Sodium is pumped out and this occurs in a neuron that is just at rest and potassium is pumped in. And what this does is this sets up um, what is called an electrochemical gradient. So this establishes an electrochemical gradient. And it's electro because it's a charged particle, sodium and potassium. And then we also have the concentration of them and we also have differences in charge between the outside and the inside of the cell. So the example here, from your book, there's a picture in your book. Okay, so this shows the net charge inside a neuron and outside a neuron. And you'll notice that the um, net charge inside is negative, right? So it is going to actually want to draw um, potassium. Um, in this case, potassium is gonna wanna leave. Sorry, potassium is gonna wanna leave because it is at a higher concentration inside the cell versus outside the cell, okay? So um, if this would be diffusion, this is not active transport. If we we're gonna actively transport something, it would be against its concentration gradient. Now sodium is at a higher concentration outside, so we also have to get sodium to be pumped out rather than diffusing in. Okay, so this shows simple diffusion, what would occur under simple diffusion, but what happens under active transport is something that's very different. Oops. Doesn't want to go. There we go. Okay. So under active transport, sodium is pumped out and potassium is pumped in. And then you notice here's my ATP molecule that's bound to this carrier molecule. And what it is doing is it is um, breaking into um, ADP and phosphate and it's releasing energy and that's what's causing potassium to flow in and sodium to flow out. So that's against their concentration gradients. Okay, so that would require energy. Now you'll notice here that the um, protein is primarily carrying the sodium and the potassium. And so this is what is called primary active transport. Okay, versus what we sometimes refer to as secondary active transport. 
And the idea here with secondary is, is that in secondary, we move one thing and something else follows. And that something else is actually really important. So the movement of one um, molecule influences or causes the movement of another. causes the movement of another. So if we look at this example, in this particular example, we want to absorb glucose. And so notice that glucose is actually at a higher concentration um, here than it is in here. So this is the inside of the cell. But notice that glucose is getting moved. And so this just shows sodium is being transported and the glucose is being co-transported. And so the glucose is being transported via secondary active transport. So it just kind of um, tags along. And this is um, just simply a mechanism um, that is used by the cell um, to transport um, things like glucose and amino acids. Um, they become um, uh, co-transported when um, another substance moves through the plasma membrane. Okay. Okay. So all of this stuff was talking about things that were small enough um, to move either with a protein or directly through the plasma membrane. And so now we need to talk about substances that um, have to be transported um, in larger amounts and they're bigger. And so this is what is called bulk transport. So it might be that we need to transport a lot of a protein to the outside of the cell. So we can talk about what is called exocytosis. Okay. And this is where a vesicle filled with molecules fuses with the outer membrane. So exo means outside, outer membrane, and releases its content. Okay. We'll just put, and releases the sub substance. And so this would be secretion. So we talked about milk. Um, and milk is secreted by mammary gland cells. And so those proteins that are produced by the milk have to be packaged into the by the Golgi apparatus into vesicles. And then those vesicles, and I, this is actually endocytosis, sorry. And those vesicles, if you look at the other page. Okay. So this is exocytosis. So this is my vesicle. It might be filled with casein protein, for example. It might be filled with insulin, it could, anything that's secreted by the cell. It moves via like a railroad track, cytoskeleton, to the outside of the thing, and then the membrane just fuses, and then it just releases its substance. And so that is what is called exocytosis. So the opposite of that is endocytosis, and this is actually what this shows. So this is where substances are engulfed by the membrane and incorporated into vesicles. So in this place, say for example, if it's incorporating a large um, piece of food or a large debris or maybe an old cell or maybe a bacteria, it produces what is called a vacuole, a food vacuole. And we talked a little bit about that because remember that um, macrophages are white blood cells that eat bacteria. And then this vacuole would be fused with a lysosome and could actually um, um, digest the bacteria and then um, present pieces of that bacteria to other white blood cells. Penocytosis is a type of endocytosis where we're taking in water. So this would be like mass drinking 
So we talked about how water moves across the plasma membrane. We also talked about how we have aquaporins, which transport water, but we also can, um, cells can drink water by creating vesicles filled with water. And then substances can be transported to the inside if they bind to receptors. And then those receptors signal the formation um, of a, a kind of engulfing it and the formation of a vesicle that has substances inside of it, okay? So you don't need to know the different types of, of um, endocytosis, but just know that this is our examples of endocytosis, okay? Okay, so that concludes the lecture on the plasma membrane. So the next topic is going to, um, we're gonna talk about um, a little bit more detail about metabolism inside the cell, and then we're going to talk about cell reproduction.